So, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Lovely to be with you. Happy solstice. <laughs> um, we had a lovely evening yesterday on the terrace, and I was very much appreciating the light which came in. So, I hope you all can enjoy one form or another of light today and uh, lighting up the beingness this morning or this day. We're going to talk about uh, some other form of lightening up the being this morning. We're going to talk about um, beginnings, endings, changes and uh, impermanence, which is uh, such a Buddhist theme. One often gets um, grasped. I think our minds have a tendency to grasp it in a way which uh, makes it not so very helpful. So we, we look whether this can help us with the letting go um, and in what way we need to understand change in so that it can really help us. Yeah. Before that, you see the chat box running and say hello to each other. Uh, make yourself, I think that is the, the beautiful blessing of this chat box, make yourself a part of the Sangha and the community. Yeah. Get in touch with each other, create, though we can't see each other and can't probably be with each other in a room as lovely as that would be. Um, get in touch with each other and create this sense of you belong here and you're part of this, um, which can be such a tremendous support for each other, for yourself. Okay, if you have any questions, reflections on the past week, uh, anything you would like to share, please put that in the chat box too and I'd be happy to come back to it later. I'm going to start with some reflections of mine and then I'll guide us into a meditation on change. <laughs> and finally, we have this reflection together. That's our plan for today. And right at the end of the session, you'll get the link. If you stay long enough, you'll see the link for the donations. And just saying a big thank you to all of you uh, who have supported my work in the past. It's a really a pleasure. A pleasure to be connected to the Sangha in this way and uh, yeah, feel deep appreciation for that. So thank you. Okay, let's look into this uh, not so easy theme. <laughs> um, you remember the sentence I stated in the beginning of the week um, on Monday, which was um, the statement of the Buddha where he said, well, nothing is worth clinging to. Nothing is worth going to be fixated on, defined by, locked in, etc. And we explored that and we said that's a notion, that's a statement of care. Yeah, it's, it's an encouragement. Um, an encouragement to see where the mind resists that, where the mind opposes that and saying, yeah, this is well worth clinging to and this is well worth and we have to and we can't be without um, and to look deeply into that. And then he said, the more we work with this sentence and the more we allow um, or give ourselves permission to say we do not have to cling, there are other ways to relate, we do not have to cling, um, the more we look into that and explore that, the more alternative ways of looking will unfold. And he named four, and we're going to do two today and two tomorrow. Um, and today he, we will talk about the Anicca and the Niroda, the aspects of seeing change and shifts and dynamics and beginnings, middles and ends. Um, and he said that is a natural looking at that. We are looking through this lens of change and shifts and dynamics is a natural way of letting go. So that you do not have to worry about how do I let go? You know, what am I supposed to do? rather than actively doing something or opening something or <laughs> trying to get rid of something, um, you, sh you shift your perspective. I find that a very interesting way of practicing, so we're going to explore it today. I think we need to talk a lot about impermanence, um, starting with why I think impermanence is not such a supportive word, uh, because the mind, as I said before, it has a tendency to get it the wrong, the wrong, the not so supportive way, yeah. Um, and it might even feel like counterintuitive. It might feel even feel like paradoxical to your clinging mind, yeah. 
a lot of our clinging actually is because we fear the change and we fear the endings. Um, we don't want to lose something or someone and thus we cling. Yeah, We don't want to experience something in the future like getting older um, and thus we don't want to see or we ignore or we uh, cling to, to me having to be youthful, yeah, whatever that is. Um, and we might experience the change in our world, not as something positive. I, I hear that a lot, for example, when I talk to participants in, in autumn. There can be like this feeling of grief, you know, somewhere is over. Yeah? And how, how on earth is this change um, going to be a support? Yeah? All good reasons to look deeper, just to, to look deeper into what this teaching of impermanence really is about. One thing it definitely is not about is acceptance through willpower. Sentences like, oh, this is impermanent, this is over, this is changing, and I just have to accept it and live with it. Yeah, it feels for me like a bit of uh, punching that in, like until the heart mind finally believes it, we use a bit of a, of, 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 um, <laughs> Of force, yeah. Uh, it feels a bit cruel, to be honest. Yeah. So, acceptance through willpower is usually uh, not my my cup of tea. So let's deepen our understanding of change. And to start that, I have a very curious little question for you. How do you actually notice change? How do you know something is changing? Well, I looked into that for myself, and my humble personal answer is what I see the mind doing. It, it takes snapshots before, after, before, after. Yeah. Um, it takes something out of, um, and, and if you do before, after, already this is very interesting because, of course, we can't, we can't possibly notice everything which is going on in just this moment. Just by you listening to me, so many things are going on in your body, in your thoughts, in your emotional currents, around you, in this room, through the sense doors, 1,001 thing and more. Yeah. So we take a snapshot of that which matters to us in this moment. Yeah. Very important. Um, and then we compare it to the next and the next and maybe a day later, a week later, a month later. Now, how precise do you think this snapshot making uh, dynamic is? Yeah. Um, if I compare this moment to the moment in an hour, how precise is this comparison going to be? Yeah. My impression is that the more mindful I am, the more likely it is that there is some precision, but how likely is it that I'm in an hour will compare the moment I'm in then to the narrative of this moment now? Yeah. To all the dots and assumptions and things um, I think I experienced in this moment. Yeah. So this whole comparison and this whole experience of change, it's not a very precise, very objective thing, is it? Yeah. And even to say, let's say I have a cup of tea here, cup of tea, um, and in an hour it will probably be either cold because I didn't get to drink it or empty uh, because I did. Um, we can speak about change. Um, but with most of our experience, it isn't that easy, is it? It's not like um, with this cup of tea that it's like switching a light switch either on or off. My experience with change is that it's not so much off or on, either or, present or absent, but something rather transforms. And even with this cup of tea, it's warm if I drink it, um, will transform my body into a different state, maybe some, some feelings of pleasantness, which then uplift the mood a bit. Yeah? So 
transforming. Um, even if I just hold it here and have my hands warm, transformation, well, it's just a tiny bit of well-being. Yeah. So experiences transform. They take on other forms rather than being off or on. Something fluctuates. That is, I find, such an interesting experience of um, impermanence or change. It's not either. It's not either there or absent. It can, can fluctuate between foreground of my attention right into your face, and then the same theme or challenge or experience. It's still there, but it lingers around somewhere in the periphery and does. It's not such a burden or such a problem. I have this a lot with um, themes, thoughts. When I start, when I try to get to sleep and something is so obvious, problematic and challenging, yeah, and so on. And after a good night of sleep, that theme is still in my life. I still notice that needs to be taken care of, but the relationship to it has shifted and now something else is in the foreground. Um, or you might worry about something or have some sorrow about something. And then a phone call comes in and someone else has a worry and a problem. And that brings things into perspective. You know, that's what we say. Things get shifted into perspective and something else comes into the foreground. And what was so problematic before, it shifts a bit back without vanishing and dissolving. So transformation, fluctuation, foreground of attention, background of attention. Also this fluctuation of unpleasant experience. It's not that even in deep states of samadhi, my unpleasant experiences probably go away. I see them fluctuating more, a bit there, a bit absent, present, absent. Moods, you know, people say to me, I have a lot of anxiety. And sometimes what I suggest is really notice, really notice, even with depression as well as with the anxiety, with states of frustration, irritation, anger. With those moods, look at the fluctuation, peaking, slowing down, bit of absence, peaking, and so on. But it's not that I am the anxious person. I'm always anxious. It's just that is storyline. Yeah. And it can be very helpful to notice that shifting and moving and dynamic experience. Mm. Last option of change and um, changeability is look at how sometimes things matter a lot. And sometimes the same things matter less, yeah. The importance, the weighing uh, of experience, that changes a lot too. That's a lot, for example, the case with self-worth, yeah. Um, I can have self-doubt and um, if I let that run, um, it becomes a big thing, yeah, and it becomes very consuming. And sometimes if that starts to evolve, bubble up, I bring myself into the garden. The garden doesn't care about my self-worth, it really doesn't. Uh, I dig my hands into the earth and the whole self-worth question, it just doesn't matter, it doesn't apply in the garden. Yeah, uh, You could do knitting or something, you know, it could uh, be a perfectionist knitter. With the garden, it's so obvious that there is no perfection. Ask the snails who eat all my salad this summer. Um, it's so obvious that there is no perfection. I find it way easier to let go of that question. So the question, even the question of how much self-worth is there or did I do it right or wrong, it just doesn't apply there. And it eases back into the background. It becomes less often of a, of a theme. So all these transformations, fluctuations, foregrounds, backgrounds, importance, less importance, all that belongs for me to the topic of a Nietzsche, of Neroda, of looking at change and changeability. That's my preferred word, changeability. I don't like impermanence that much because it puts such an emphasis, such an emphasis on the endings. Yeah, and that is, um, if, if we look into that, I wonder, I wonder if you notice how much our how much our experience of change is a question of perception and interpretation. Do you notice that? What I pay attention to and how I pay attention to, what I pick out of this experience of the moment or around all aspects of my life. Yeah, If I, if I talk about youth and getting older, 
I'm picking out one aspect of my life and give that a lot of importance, whereas I might neglect a lot of other aspects of my life. Yeah, And that is a question of perception. What do I perceive? What do I give importance to? How do I interpret things? Yeah. Um, all this makes change a very subjective, situative, interpreted experience. Yeah. And that's not a problem. And we can live with change and you can name it change. But just can we be aware of how the Buddha would say empty it is? It's empty, not in the sense that it's not real or not there, but it's not fixed. Yeah, it's subjective. It's your change in this moment, my perception of change in this moment. And when we acknowledge that, something wonderful happens to say, ah, oh, if change is dependent on my perception and my interpretation, am I then not able to shift and use and look at change in ways that make it helpful? Yeah. If it's, if it's, subject to interpretation and perception um, in the first place. Why not use our ways of perceiving things and interpreting things in a way which makes it helpful? Yeah. Okay, couple of examples. Your perception of change, which can make it very painful, can be a hyper focus on one aspect of change. For example, a hyper focus on the presence or absence of something. The mind continuously decides there, not there, there, not there. Yeah. Um, some people in relationships experience that a lot. If the other is there, everything is fine. If he or she or them is absent, everything is not so fine. Yeah. Um, and a lovely question for that practice would be, well, notice your notice the change within you in the mood, in the perception of self, in the sense of self-worth, etc. During phases which we call absence and during phases which we call presence, and you will notice there is shift anyway. Yeah. Sometimes I'm very close to the person and it's close to me physically. Sometimes I'm very close to the person. It's not here in this room, but I feel a closeness, a connection. Yeah. And so on. So the hyper focus on either presence or absence, mind doing either or things, or a hyper-focus on ends and changes, yeah. The, I bring up the, it was very interesting, I, I did a uh, exploration on a group lately on uh, different aspects of emptiness, and we talked about impermanence as well, and I suggested different practices to them, and they came back and they reported their relationships to endings. I said, well, that is so interesting. Did any one of you look at beginnings? Did any one of you look at middles? Why do we have this tendency to look at ends and endings and that which goes away first? Yeah, I think it's a little fear, a little existential fear um, within us which makes us do that. But do we have the permission and do we have the agility in our mindfulness practice? To say, let me balance that out. Looking at change and endings only might not be very well balanced. So what about the beginnings and the pleasant changes? What about that which comes into your life and enriches that? You know, something opening up a possibility, something uh, yeah, which, which is pleasant. I, I noticed that for myself. If something, something goes wrong, how much attention do I pay to that? But if something goes right and I go lucky on something, it's just like, oh, yeah, nice. And I go on with it. I never or very rarely um, give that as much attention and celebration as I do sorrow and worry about something which goes wrong or ends. Yeah. So there's an imbalance and that imbalance shifts my perspective. Mm -hmm. To be frozen, that is another thing we can play with, to, to ease up the freeze um, of the before and after images in your life. Before I was that youthful person who could do A, B, C, D, E, um, 
and now I'm that old person or older person or whatever. I've, I've lost this in my life or that came into my life, which allows me not to do that anymore. Before, after, before, after, like um, all those uh, <laughs> styling videos where you have this very absurd way of saying this is the person before, this is after, and we believe that. That's so not true. That before, person before looked many ways and that person after will look many ways um it's this snapshot yeah which uh, freezes us freezes us into this is who i am this is mine this is uh what defines me so easing up the freeze and saying i am many things i was many things and i will be many things yeah so that we come back and, and then to notice really to use your mindfulness to notice those many things so a couple of suggestions further to play with that. When we see that the mind starts to cling to one aspect in our lives, yeah, to say, well, we care for the youth or we care for the change in, in the job or in the relationship. What else is there? I'm, I'm, to have some confidence, this is the, what the Buddha talked about, and to say that nothing is worth clinging to can translate to, to some confidence and saying, yeah, but I'm more than that. That is um, hard. That is challenging. Um, and I'm not going to make this the only aspect of my life. Yeah, Even with great sickness and um, challenging experience, it's not a question of dismissal or um, having no compassion with yourself. Quite the contrary. I find it very helpful to say, what else is there? What else can I pay attention to? What can I notice is changing? Yeah. Um, and then to include, include the challenge in the large amount of things which are there. So this is one aspect of my life and it needs proper care and attention. And there is more to it. So maybe you want to practice today with just noticing change on the many levels. Of the obvious ones, time of day and weather and surroundings. And in your relationships, in contact, not so much in contact, in group, alone. With family and friends, with strangers, close, further off, uh, feeling belonging, feeling not belonging, change in relationships. Our physical experience, of course, the obvious one. Now my body feels like this. Now I would say my energy center is here and then it's in, in, in the belly and that shifts all day long. My energy level shifts. My body, body needs shift all day long. Same for emotions and moods. Notice the smaller and larger changes there. And such a, a endless and nourishing field to explore Notice the fields of self-reference. How would you describe yourself right now? And then ask yourself in an hour. And then ask yourself this evening. How would you define yourself right now? And by what would you define yourself? Yeah. What, what do you use <laughs> as an anchor for definition for self? The mind does it. Um, does it anyways. Uh, so what does the mind use as an anchor for definition for self? Are these the different roles? And then can you see how during the day, on work, off work, with family, off family, the different roles change and the self-reference changes. Yeah. So just notice these changes and then see whether they can help you to unstuck, to bring something back into motion, into movement, to let go so that the letting go of the clinging can naturally happen. Okay. That is what I wanted to share this morning. Now we're going to practice with it. So have a seat, have some place to lie down, feel like standing up, it's up to you. Maybe allow yourself or your body some wriggling moments to really accommodate the posture.
and then we bring our attention to you can choose depending on your surroundings either the looking you can keep the eyes open or the listening and just allow either the sounds to touch consciousness or just allow the eyes to wander look at one thing and look at one thing and then going there and just notice how the eyes move through the space around you and how our brain is so quick eyes taking snapshots this moment this moment and our brains create an ongoing experience like a movie for us quite fascinating And with the listening as well, you notice background noises, you notice some rather continuous noises, and then something might break and come into the foreground of attention. And you might notice how your attention shifts and wavers and fluctuates between one experience and the other. You could stay here at the sense doors, listening, looking. And when you want to, you come within the bodily experience, this field. And here too, there are so many things to experience. And they're not neatly coming one after the other, but they can be running parallel and aside each other. And you can just notice what comes to the full foreground of your attention. What is the most obvious experience of your body right now? Will you settle your attention there and wait? And after a long or short while, something else becomes important to the attention. Now it wants to look there. Maybe we can allow, give our attention permission this morning to just roam through the field of bodily experience, not giving anything particular interest or needing to take care of anything. more interested in seeing the whole change going on in this bodily field.
Sometimes you might notice how that flux, that fluidity is interrupted because the mind, the heart mind, stops somewhere and gives something extra important. Say, oh, this is something I want to stay with, need to stay with, have to stay with. As it picks out a particular experience, either in your thoughts or in your emotions or in your body, and gives it extra importance to. Maybe it's preoccupied that this popped up in consciousness saying, oh, alarm, alarm, here's something off. And with a very caring, soothing quality, we can turn to that saying, no, it's all safe. We're sitting here, we're lying here, we're standing here. It's all good in mind. And then gently ask, what else is there? Back into the river of experience. Or you could acknowledge saying, yeah, this is unpleasant. This feels like a challenge. And I come to take care of that later. Not forgotten. Unpleasant experiences can feel like little tasks opening up, popping up, saying, take notice of me, take care of me, change me, this is unpleasant. And sometimes we can, for good reason, to say, no, not right now, dear one. We do not have to be called to every little task of unpleasantness in our bodies, you can say, no, thank you, not now. And shift back into this question, what else is there? What else, what obvious other experiences are there? And even if you have a lot of thoughts, just notice how there are periods where you are deeply drawn into your thoughts and thinking. And then you wake up and then you for a while with the body, an inhale or an exhale. And then off you go again. But to say you're thinking all of the time, would that be appropriate?
You can, if you want to, also look at the experience of pleasant, unpleasant and neutral with all of the physical experience you have or the thoughts or any sound, sight, taste, smell, touch coming in. All of that comes with a little extra information being pleasant, unpleasant and neutral with different intensity of pleasantness, unpleasantness and the subtle neutral in between. And while your mind shifts between these experiences, see how you are touched temporarily by pleasant and unpleasant experiences. And then see how your attention shifts to something else and the feeling tone shifts with it. Remember that there is an infinite amount to be experienced in this moment. So just take the obvious ones. There will be a lot you won't touch and won't become fully aware of. Don't feel pressure to notice everything, but rather let this attention move slowly and carefully, one experience after the next. You might even be able to notice the shifts in the quality of your attention. It was precise and then it's drifty and dreamy, a bit vague or foggy. And then your quality of attention becomes broad, light, curious. You might notice it can be rather tight or soft and open. So even the tool with what you are getting in touch with everything is changing and shifting.
And then we consciously broaden our attention and feel out the whole body, whole body heart and care, and maybe this oh, sensitivity of yours, this heart mind held and care. It's quite something to live as a human being in this world, which is constantly changing, shifting, new and different. Maybe some warmth and some compassion can arise to say, well, that's a lot to ask. What a task to ask, said Mary Oliver. And then gently start moving feet and hand. Start moving your body and yawn and sigh and stretch as much as you like. And when you feel ready, you make your journey back to this screen. So I'll put in the Pali words because that was a question until I have you all back, which I need to show. It's me, Rhoda. And uh, one thing I was wondering during the meditation is whether we shouldn't say, there's this old saying, this, shall, this too shall pass. What about changing it to this too shall change? <laughs> um, to take out the emphasis on endings. So I would be curious about your experience this morning. How this, did this topic of um, change and changeability land with you? Anything supportive or healthy or worthwhile? practicing and deepening you see in it, or anything challenging and problematic, maybe a question um, which arose for you during this practice. I would be very happy to hear about that, or anything I should clarify on um, about my talk. And uh, just while you're typing, I'm, I'm always using these few minutes of silence to uh, let you know about uh, one of my courses coming up. And this morning, it's going to be the Dharma Yatra. We have a few spaces left for adults, and we have, that's a community practice um, I'm offering in the beginning of August. We're going to hike and walk and sing and meditate and dance together for a week. And uh, yeah, if you'd like, to, if you're interested, read read about it. Maybe ask me a couple of questions. I'd be happy to have you with us. Medi is writing. Noticing the change is very subtle. Yes, Medi. Um, good point. Um, there is no sense in trying to go as on a macro, a micro level as we did right now in daily life. That would be very subtle, and oh, our perception has a different form of coarseness during the day, which is absolutely okay. Um, it might even be now in the meditation that it was too fine for the perception, for the quickness, for the bounciness of our perception this morning, so that would be okay. Then I need to notice larger chunks, just larger chunks, um, make it usually easier because on the subtleness. Yeah, if it's too subtle, the mind might get bored, it might get frustrated, it might get um, distracted very easily. So how fine and how coarse you make your chunks of change uh, will determine how much you're able to notice it. Okay, Wendy said, this tool will change rather than pass is very helpful. Great. Yeah, notice that. Notice the difference, what it because I think sometimes this emphasis of endings, it's triggering. It's triggering the worrying mind. It's triggering um, some existential fear of loss, yeah, which we feel like we can't stomach. It's too much. So <clears throat> um, to talk about change, which has the option for fluctuation, which has the option for now this is important, now that is important, um, for me it gives a different taste to this whole teaching. Michelle is writing, 
I've noticed lately how I am changing. This has helped me to see it as it is. Yeah, constant, a part of life, being human, and it can be beautiful. Yeah, yeah, to really acknowledge change. Yeah, um, sometimes the, the the idea of the change is big on what it all will impact and what it will mean for me and everything. If I go to it and really notice it, yeah, I notice, oh, now this change is pleasant and now it's unpleasant. Now it's important and now it's less important. Um, it becomes more approachable. Yeah, it becomes less, less, uh, less fear, fear, uh, triggering. So, yeah. And then acceptance. If it's, if it's in the narrative too much and if it's in the vague too much, um, it can be fear inducing. But if you hold, bring it into the preciseness of the mindfulness of the moment to say, okay, now it's really burdensome and now it's in the background, yeah, um, it becomes something we can hold and that makes acceptance then possible. Beautiful. Anyone else wanting to share their experience? Carol is writing, I really appreciate the talk and the meditation this morning. I find the focus on change and impermanence very helpful, and I notice this in myself, the changes that take place. Mm. But when others show me sides of themselves that hurt, I forget that others also go through changes instead. I see the hurtful thing done as permanent and difficult to see as impermanent. Yeah. So, um, that is an interesting one. Where to notice the change? I can sit there and hope that the other will finally change or change their mind or change their view or change, change, change. And um, <laughs> to wait for the change in the outer, uh, usually, at least for me, comes with a feeling of uh, helplessness. Yeah, to so just sit there and hope for someone to be different or something to be different. I can also look into, oh, at the moment I'm okay with this words being spoken in this view at the moment i can look at something different at the moment there is even some compassion for this person and now i'm not yeah now now i'm fully in yeah and i need to take care of this hard mind um so very interesting to turn towards my experience of this painful conflict uh, moment and to see how my relationship to that person also changes minute by minute now i'm okay with you now i'm not now the story is back now I'm free from the story. And sometimes this is the thing we can have more play and more exploration with than just helping in the change in the other. So just a just a suggestion for yet another uh, field of exploration. Chain is writing. How we concentrate on endings, what a choice to start looking for new beginnings and middles and constant fluctuations. Yeah just add it to the picture of course the, the endings belong we don't want to ignore them and they can be they can rise as a helpful sense of if, I, if i'm aware that things are not permanently the way they are i relate to them differently i might have um, a form of, of gratitude or um feeling of enrichment while they are still there so there is a place for endings um but not to make them the sole focus yeah uh, and opening up to the in beginnings, the end things, the, the fluctuations, the different perspectives. Beautiful chain. Laura's writing, at first all the possibilities of focus is overwhelming, but then it's also wonderful that there is so much choice. Beautiful, Laura. Yeah. So that is a double practice, you see, beautifully described, to say, well, if I dive into this just this moment in meditation, it's just like, whoa. <laughs> um, feel, bodily feelings, feeling tones, um, sense or impressions, thoughts, emotional currents to say, wow, this is a big river. <laughs> and then to learn, if that is part of the meditation practice, to learn how to deal with that and to say, well, um, if, if it's a river, there's natural rivers, there has sometimes side arms, you yeah? know, for a while I'm going to to float on this side arm, then I'm going back to the main river and then paying attention to that. So there is choice. And I love that. Laura. So Vina is saying, what about if you cling to your dear life? Yes, um, definitely. That is an existential experience we all have. Um, the mind will, the heart mind will cling to living. And I think that's an absolutely healthy thing. Yeah. 
But can I ask my dear heart mind a bit of a question here? What, what is it you feel? What is it you feel before? What is it which is missing? What is the need which is triggered? What is the, the hunger which is active? Because clinging for dear life can mean many things and it can be a very fearful state. So to bring the fear back into something more precise and saying, dear heart mind, what is it? More precise, more precision to take it out of the way and into something more manageable. Yeah, because clinging to dear life or being fearful for dear life is usually too much to handle, overwhelming. Wolfgang is writing. <laughs> Late again, doesn't matter, you're very welcome. <laughs> okay. Jane, she writes, habitually frozen in close relationship is so painful. Yeah, yeah. Um, when we feel stuck and frozen straight, it's really like this emphasis of our practice. We talked about willpower a little bit yesterday. This is where we can use it a little bit to say, dear heart, mind, just a little umph to say, okay, what else can we look in? Yeah, what else can I give importance to? What else can I? drink in what else than the relationship is part of my life yeah so that oh i create a bit more opaque spaciousness around that um natalie is writing could you clarify what you understand by clinging nothing is worth clinging to recently my lovely neighbors of the two and a half years moved back to the us i found the ending painful yeah a sense of loss yes I know things have changed. Could you speak to this? Yeah, important question. That is not clinging. Lovely neighbors leave or kids leave the house or um, we experience a loss of any sort. That is not clinging. We're not, we're not sorry or worried or, or, or sad because we're clinging. Oh, good that you mentioned that. Um, that is grief. And grief is natural and beautiful and belongs. Clinging would be to say, if those neighbors move out, um, I will never have neighbors like them again. Yeah, that no one can potentially come and fill up that place. And the new neighbors, they come in and say, ah, oh. you compare them and say, ah, oh, they're just like really not how the old neighbors are. And something contracts, contracts around this theme of lovely neighbors. It can contract in the inner and say, now that they're gone, I, I'm not going to be as connected again or as, as as happy again you see it's not the grief and the sadness it's that which forms around it and hardens something grief is a very natural moving flowing state which brings us from acknowledging and being with the loss towards um then finally a sense of gratitude and recognizing what is important to us what is of value to us what matters to us yeah so maybe there was something in the connection to the neighbors which was really dear and nourishing to you, which can be celebrated and looked for. Yeah. I hope that clarifies it a bit. If you want to know more about clinging, there um, I have done a series on the Four Noble Truths, which you will find on Sangha Life online, where I think um, in the second in the second uh, week we did on that. There is an entire week on clinging. Okay. Lissy's writing, the only trouble with thinking about change for me is that the fact that there is limited time can bring about more drive, drive to make, often with intensity to compensate for the time I may have wasted over the years. Oh, great one. Perception of time, here we have, yeah. The emphasis on, on, on an ending will bring a totally different perception of time than the emphasis of a beginning, yeah. Um, and can I play with that? So a sense of, look, emphasizing the ending can bring up some urgency, which can be helpful. And overemphasize on the ending will bring a rush, you know, a hectic, uh, a pressure into uh, whatever we're doing, whatever is dear to us. So can I play with the perception of time and saying, now maybe I'm not so much emphasizing the ending, I'm emphasizing being in the middle of something, Yeah. You know? And see how that will change my perception of time. In the end, we all don't know how much time we have. Yeah. So that is just a, a narrative, anyways. Jane is, Jane is writing. I notice that for me, change usually means for the worse. Great. Something I don't like. Yeah. How to change this negativity around change? Beautifully, beautifully spotted. Once you spotted something like this, you can work with it. So now easy exercise for the everyday, notice change and notice particularly 
the positive change. There is positive change all day long. Look for the small, pleasant experiences. No fireworks, no roses, no, no nothing like that. Just the small, pleasant things happening within the change. And over time, this might balance out. This might balance out the perception. Great. Ruth is writing. Yeah, great one. Endings also have beginnings and middles and endings. Yes. So something we call ending is still a fluctuating, moving, foreground, background uh, process. So it, it never, you know, the, the wave of ending, it looks um, beginning, middle and end. We depict it as this, but it's like really, it's like more something like that or like that going a bit forward and backward. So that is excellent, Ruth, to mention that, to say it's not as stringent and linear as our mind pictures it. And we can notice that and make it a bit more um, handable. Yeah, thank you. Oh, wow, there are a lot of questions today. Beautiful. Alison is writing, thank you for the teachings. I'm happy to. I attended a fun funeral yesterday and the celebration of my friend's life really made me feel the impermanence of everything. The beginning, the middle and the end. Quite beautiful. Yes. And the fact that you write quite beautiful um, means that there is, was something enriching and not something fearful. Sometimes we approach beginning, middle and end and it's enriching and it's invigorating and it's bringing up some, some, some sorts of saying, yeah, there is something precious in this life. And some things, it, sometimes it will um trick of fear and it's so interesting to say it's not the beginning and the middle and the end it's our relationship to it which makes the change okay Gwen is writing and um, i'm going to collect the other questions uh nika uh, i see a question i come back to it <laughs> and lissy as well um tomorrow so Gwen is writing sometimes when things are difficult this too will pass can help for, yeah, yeah. So here is the emphasis on the ending, yeah. We can also say this too will change because that makes it sometimes a bit more realistic and the mind will easier buy into it. Sometimes things do not change so, do not end so quickly. But my relationship to it and my its presence in my life and its, its importance in my life, it can even, if just for a minute or two, it can change. So. You play with the words and see what is helpful. Okay. Um, Mika, I copy your question and Lissy as well. So thank you so much for this morning's session. It was lovely. And thank you for the rich explorations and your curiosity around that theme. That makes it really uh, extra beautiful to be with you. And I wish you a lovely day. Explore change if you like. Um, find new aspects about it. and. Go well wherever you go. Thank you so much.